Hi, everybody. Uh, Rev Charbert here. Welcome to our February 2024 Green Faith Circle program um, that you are watching on YouTube. We've got some uh, uh, members of our Green Faith Circle ministry here with us, and we're going to be having a fantastic conversation today about some specific research around ecology, environmentalism, public health. But first, I just want to um, allow everyone who's on the screen to um, say hello introduce where you who you are where you're hailing from hi I'm hi dennis. I'm <laughs> hey dennis how about dennis and selena yeah that sounds good and we're coming to you from southwestern wisconsin usa all right dennis and selena Hi, this is Selena Fox, and I've been involved in environmental work throughout my adult life and even into my youth. And um, we are coming to you from a forest in southwestern Wisconsin that is land that adjoins Circle Sanctuary Nature Preserve, which is a 200 acre nature sanctuary that I helped birth back in 1983. It's a headquarters for Circle Sanctuary, a nature spirituality church that's part of the larger Green Faith International Network. Great to be here. Great. I'm Jess. Hi, everyone. I'm Jess LeClaire, and um, I will introduce myself more in a little bit. And I'm excited to uh, have the opportunity to share and discuss my research with all of you. Thank you. I'm so glad you're here. And and Char Bear here, I'm hailing to y'all from the central coast of California, way out in the West Coast. So I represent some of the ongoing cyber ministries that Circle Sanctuary has year round. Um, if I don't see you at PSG, then you're likely to see me in a pixel on some form of Zoom. So um, I wanted to to just lift up for a minute before we get into the, the specifics. Um, I wanted to show you something that's kind of cool. We're really happy about this. I'm gonna share screen. If you go, since I know that we're mostly speaking to Circle Sanctuary friends and community, if you go to the Circle Sanctuary website, you've got an opportunity to look at our work. Go click on our work and go down to Circle Green. You see that little puppy? This has now been popped. Populated. I want to stay, uh, thank Steve Curtin for helping us with this. You're going to see um, about the, the Circle Sanctuary Nature Preserve that Selena just referenced, the Circle Cemetery. Um, awesome green burial options there. I'm going to do it. I'm not near, I'm not near it now, but I will do it. If you are interested in opting into our Green Faith uh, ministry, please uh, throw me a line by clicking on that link and saying, yes, I am a member of Circle Sanctuary, and yes, I would like to be part of the Green Faith Circle ministry. Um, if you're not a member of Circle Sanctuary, I really want to encourage you to be. Um, just join. It's not expensive, but join at a level you can afford, and you are supporting so many ministries throughout our national network that really make a difference for a lot of people. You can go to Blue Marble Eco Podcasting, which uh, every month comes up with a new program about what you can do to be uh, an ally with the planet. And here you'll see the Green Faith Circle on YouTube. You see other meetings we've had. Uh, and you'll be seeing this one loaded up there as well. I just want to scroll down here, eco networking. And if you do happen to click on other eco links, it's populated with so many other links that help connect you to lots of responsible uh, information. If you opt into the Green Faith uh, Ministry, you will be able to be a part of these live conversations and maybe uh, be a presenter yourself, which is pretty cool. And um, you'd also have access to our private Facebook page, which is a great repository of a lot of really responsible information about eco-justice and climate change. If you click on Blue Marble, I want to highlight that Jess did a fantastic Blue Marble podcast with me uh, December 15th. 
you can go there, Jess LeClaire. I hope you're seeing all this because um, I'm showing you how easy it is to click and access all these things from the Circle Sanctuary webpage. But here you'll see her whole podcast that she did. And, and that's an hour long program, definitely worth listening to. So there you have it. Isn't that fun? That's really fun. And I hope that was as facile for you all watching as it was for me moving around. So tonight, um, Jess, you know, I should say Dr. Jessica LeClaire, who has been a lifelong member of Circle. Um, you grew up with Circle, and you're a clinical faculty member and postdoctoral trainee at the University of Wisconsin Madison School of Nursing. Um, you've worked as a public health nurse for Public Health Madison and Dane County. And I love this as a community health nurse for the Ho Chunk Nation. Um, and I, I'm so excited to hear more about your research tonight. So again, thanks for sharing with us. Yeah, thanks so much again for um, inviting me back. And I really um, have enjoyed joining this group. Um, I'm so thankful for it. And I'll before I get into uh, my presentation, and then I'm really excited for a discussion, just a bit of the premise was that, yes, I've been a, a member of Circle Sanctuary for as long as I can remember. And um, when I came to the fall equinox uh, celebration and to, to catch up with Selena a little bit, I shared that I had graduated from the PhD program and I was studying climate justice. And then she immediately said, oh, you have to meet Charbert and the Green Faith Circle and all of that. And, you know, I brought it up because I had surprising findings, not necessarily surprising, but really interesting findings that I thought of Circle Sanctuary when I found them. And I thought I really want to discuss these findings with all of you who I consider experts in nature spirituality. So um, so with that, I think this was meant to be, and I'm just really excited to um, share all of this with you. Um, okay, so I'm going to share my screen and um, let's see, you can let me know how it's looking on your end maybe. Can you see that okay? Yeah, perfect. We see the slides. It's great. Slides? Okay. So this is um, a presentation that I'm somewhat adapting a little bit from my dissertation <laughs> presentation. And um, and my research is on uh, the climate justice perspectives and experiences of public health nurses and their community partners. And I'll get into what all of that means, why public health nurses and so on. Um, but again, I think in the context of this, and for anyone that's listening in the future, you know, we can expand the idea of nurses to think about those that are caring for the planet, the healers in your own lives. Um, we can expand this idea and concept of nurse, because this is sort of where my research is going to. So I'm interested in some of your thoughts on that. Um, okay. I do want to, and also if someone, I can't necessarily see if anyone's raising their hand or has a question or wants to jump in. So um, maybe Shari, you can just let me know and we can go from there. Um, but I, I do, I wanna start off with uh, briefly describing the climate justice movement. I know many of you are very familiar with it, but just so in case anyone's listening and they're not that familiar with it. Um, I also wanna talk again why my research um, has been primarily focused on public health nursing. So I'm beginning with just a few key terms that I'm using throughout the presentation and, and the discussion. Um, so racialized and low-income communities are sometimes referred to as frontline or fenceline communities. Um, frontline communities are often the first to experience the climate crisis, right? So thinking about people who experience the climate crisis, the first, but also the worst. Uh, fence line communities are groups that are living close enough to um, an industrial or a toxic environment to experience direct harm from that associated pollution. And so in response to these injustices, climate justice uh, emerged as a sub-movement of the environmental justice movement over two decades ago uh, to redefine climate change as a civil rights issue. Okay. Thanks. Jess, may I also make a comment there? Um, I know frontline communities are so often described as like communities of color. 
Um, but it can also include, like you said, any community that has experienced disastrous climate impacts, uh, regardless of social demographics. If you've been forced to relocate or have found yourself being a climate refugee of some kind because you um, have been forced to uh, lose your home or or relocate or, or, or have to move or, or do anything like that because of a climate impact, then you can be considered a frontline community. Is that correct? Yeah, often it is people that are low income too. Um, so people that um, might not have the resources to withstand, for example, um, the weather, the weather changes, but also you are absolutely right. Um, anyone really that is ex really hit the hardest or hit first um, than other people might in, in their own community or surrounding communities. So um, yeah, yeah, there's lots of examples of that. Thank you for bringing that up. So um, as we were just starting to talk about, climate injustices um, presents significant sources of death and diseases um, within these uh, frontline and fenceline communities. And my background, as you heard earlier, is public health nursing. And that's defined as the practice of promoting and protecting the health of populations. So, um, public health nursing isn't something that many people know about. Um, maybe that's changed since, since COVID. Um, but typically, we're not working in hospitals at the bedside. We're working um, in communities with communities to address um, community identified uh, health issues or health inequities that they want to improve. Um, we, as public health nurses, often work with or partner with community based organizations, also called CBOs for short. Um, and those are organizations that are resident driven to address, again, resident identified social issues that they want to improve in their community. Um, and they partner usually through like developing and implementing public health interventions through these partnerships. But what I found um, as a nurse educator, when I attempted to bring all of this knowledge into the classroom about what should the future nursing workforce do to advance climate justice, I found there really was this lack of uh, published information on public health nurse and community-based organization partnership strategies, specifically to advance climate justice. Um, what I did find is that uh, public health nurses have expressed this lack of preparedness in addressing uh, the health impacts of climate change that they're seeing. Um, and there hasn't really been this assessment of um, public health nurses' preparedness to advance climate justice, right? So again, looking at climate change as a civil rights issue. So that led me to uh, enter the PhD program. And again, in the podcast, I... I, I go through that history in a lot more detail, um, but that led me to the study, which was to really understand what are some effective uh, public health nursing or PHN strategies to advance climate justice by describing how nurses and their community-based organization partners, who again are working, already working in these frontline and fenceline communities, how are they understanding or conceptualizing climate justice? and how are their perspectives and their lived experiences informing their partnership strategies and their, their partnership processes um, to advance climate justice in these communities? So these are the three different aims of the study. Um, but for today, I wanna focus in on describing how nurses and their community partners uh, envisioned and experienced climate justice within these frontline and fenceline communities. For those who like to geek out on theory, <laughs> my study is informed by these different models. Um, I'm not gonna go into them in great detail, uh, but I can if there's questions, but in short, uh, I looked at the critical environmental justice nursing for planetary health framework, um, the social ecological model, the lived experience model, the public health intervention wheel, and the authentic partnerships model. Again, not going into this, for the sake of time, but I can if there's questions. So to recruit for the study, I sent a link to a screening survey to assist with some sampling of nurses at national and state level nursing, public health, 
and climate and health organizations of which there are many. Uh, the nurses who were interested in uh, sharing their experiences with me then shared the opportunity to participate with their community partners. So 13 people total enrolled in the study, um, including the, the five nurse and community partner pairs, and then three nurses um, enrolled without their community partners for what we're calling partial data collection. And the locations spanned uh, the geographic areas uh, that you see here. So nurses enrolled in the study reporting, uh, working to advance climate justice through either academic or nonprofit work settings. And I do have a QR code here uh, to the Google Earth link to this map of their partnership location. So uh, you're welcome to further explore it as you like. Uh, so I collected data through something called participatory photo mapping, which I use to understand their uh, the participants' climate justice perspectives and their lived experiences by asking them to take pictures of what climate justice looks like and means to them. And then they presented the pictures and their stories in an interview session with me. So hopefully to put it simply through maps like you see here, photos and stories, the community members can then uh, relate where their experiences occurred, what they look like and how they happened. I also interviewed each individual participant. So the participatory photo mapping was done in pairs. They Each pair came together and it was like a conversation like we're having today, or we will have when I'm done sharing this. But then I also talked to each person individually. And I asked them to describe their strategies, how they partner together from their perspective to advance climate justice. So I used just some initial open-ended gen generative questions, like tell me how you came to practice in community. And then they, um, the questions also reflected a, a critical approach through um, questioning about the systems of injustice that then led to climate injustices that they were experiencing. I also utilized uh, the GPS coordinates associated with each photo to map the environmental justice indicators within each community with the United States uh, Environmental Protection Agency's EJ screen tool, uh, which is a nationally consistent uh, data set of environmental justice community indicators. Anyone can utilize it for your own work. It's, it's free to the public. Um, and I did this to enhance that community level mapping with some further data on environmental exposures that might or might not have been mentioned by the participants. So I, this also helped ensure that uh, I gathered the most complete picture, if you will, of climate justice in these communities. So here are the results um, initially depicted on what's called a thematic map. Um, Again, I conducted thematic analysis for those that want to know the method that I used uh, of the transcripts. And we found 16 broad themes um, were identified from 21 uh, photo transcripts and then and semi-structured interview transcripts, as well as 49 photographs. And all of these themes uh, reflect an agreement between the community partner and the nurse. So meaning that None of the themes that you see here uh, re reflect only the nurse or only the community partner perspectives, right? So this is something that they agreed on. Uh, so as uh, we uncovered the themes, it became really clear that there are three categories to organize them. So on the left hand on side of your screen, you see the climate injustice category. On the right hand, you see climate justice. And then in the middle is this transition period from climate injustice to climate justice, this transition. And so the results consist of nine climate injustice themes that you see here. Uh, one theme, the long struggle was identified by participants uh, for that transition from climate injustice to climate justice. And then there were six climate justice themes. And 
Uh, for those that might be familiar with the social ecological model, the thematic map is organized sort of like that. So it displays these um, interactive characteristics of individuals, community, and society, and the root causes of the public health outcomes we're seeing today. The levels are also interactive and they're reinforcing. So they end up having this cumulative effect on health and well being. And um, for those that are interested or practice nature spirituality, you might see some things that are very interesting here. And so we're gonna go into each of these themes in some more detail. So as I go through this, I'm gonna present the results for each theme that you see here, including uh, a definition of the theme. There also is a list of some of the sub-themes or aspects of that theme that were identified by participants. For the sake of time, I'm only gonna highlight one or two of those aspects or sub-themes um, I'll also share the results from the EJ screen, um, if there are any, on each of the slides. Um, we don't necessarily have time uh, to read all of the narratives that you see here for during the presentation, but the slide, uh, each slide does contain a QR code, again, to an, a Google Earth link, so you can further explore all of the themes from the study. So for this first one, Severance from Nature, this link takes you to all of the pictures and all of the narratives around Severance from Nature. So you'll be able to click through all of that. So it's very interactive in that way. Let me know if anyone has trouble getting to it. Um, okay, so let's begin with this first. Again, this is a climate injustice theme of Severance from Nature. Uh, this theme was primarily highlighted by people who self-identified as indigenous during their interviews with me. Um, Severance from Nature speaks to, of a colonial wounding from the severance of relationships within nature. Um, some sub-themes from the participant data highlight this overarching paradigm of colonial disconnection from nature as this hierarchical cultural worldview that has been integrated into systems and policies and is used to validate human domination over all other beings, over all other life. Big one. Yeah. This next theme of supremacy refers to the patterns of domination that disadvantage all but a few. So thinking about colonialism, cis hetero patriarchy were very high, were highlighted as these intersecting patterns of domination by multiple people who again identified as indigenous. Uh, most participants did name environmental racism as a root cause of how frontline and fence line communities are formed and described how it challenged their ability to address environmental degradation when people who are outside of their communities view them as less than human. EJ screen data did show that every community in the study had socioeconomic indicators that aligned with participant stories of marginalization. But the EJ screen tool interestingly did not identify two groups as disadvantaged, which did conflict with uh, some of the participant stories from those areas. This next theme of uh, corporate capitalism, um, I'll read the definition here because people were describing this and I found it actually is a thing in the literature. So corporate capitalism, uh, is defined as owners of the means of production are not expected to create products and hire laborers for the social good, but rather as a means of creating profit and accumulating further capital for their own self-interest. And many, mm -hmm. pe many people shared how corporations uh, exploit and extract, again, from marginalized populations, such as this group living in Appalachia region, who took the picture that you see here and the narrative. And this particularly was looking at the fracking industry in Appalachia. 
almost all of the extraction industries. Yeah. Yeah. Then participants described this theme of corporate climate pollution as the toxic waste from corporations that also perpetuate climate change. Some participants uh, use this term sacrifice zone to describe how their community's health is sacrificed to support the health of the corporate industry. So findings from the EJ screen data showed the presence of polluting facilities in all of the study areas. Three groups explicitly discussed this uh, in their interviews. The presence of extraction industries, like again, fracking, like mining, uh, were not included as the EPA's EJ screen indicators. Um, but the EJ screen data did support participant perspectives and their experience with climate concerns. So uh, with all, all of the study areas were deemed very high risk for either flooding or wildfires. And three areas were actually high risk for both. State violence uh, was another theme that arose to the top. This is again in the context of climate justice. I had to pull from the literature from a couple different sources to understand this, but um, it was described and is defined in the literature as this deliberate use of institutions of colonial state power to inflict violence, including human caused climate disruption and the removal of the right to access healthy natural resources. That sustains injustices around human dignity, culture, recognition, and this overall right to life. So as you can see um, in the sub-themes, participants identified many, many aspects of state violence. Uh, they discussed the way that corporate or sorry, government agencies and politicians protect themselves through uh, the lack of transparent communication about health risks and or sometimes even partnering with the media to perpetuate some harmful stories, but then promotes uh, a false sense of safety and security, as you see here from the photo and the narrative. Um, study participants discuss death among community members. So mortality means uh, the death rate or the number of deaths in a population. And participants um, also highlighted that mortality is a multi-species issue. It's also an intergenerational concern in their communities. Um, and the EJ screen data did show really high rates of lower life expectance uh, for nearly all of the study areas. Many people also discussed diseases in their community. So this theme of morbidity means um, having a disease or a symptom of a disease or the amount of disease in a population. And people perceived uh, that frontline and fence line community members experience a real dangerous lack of understanding about the relationship between their health and environmental exposures and degradation. Um, and again, this is the, the participants in the study talking about like their community members, their neighbors, their families, so on and so forth. And um, the EJ screen data did show that most of the communities in the study were very high risk for like heart disease and cancers and, and other um, diseases in the area. This theme of despair also rose up. And uh, this means that there's a loss of hope in the fight for climate justice. Uh, a sense of powerlessness was mentioned by people in the study, including again, a really deep concern for youth, uh, for young adults, um, as is shared in this uh, photo and the narrative. And I'll just, I know it's a long narrative, but I'll just highlight that she's, she's talking to a bartender and he's saying, why should we do anything if we're gonna die anyway, right? Okay, so as you can see again on the left-hand side, those themes encompass the climate injustice perspectives and experiences of the nurses and their community partners. 
The next category um, is this transition. And this is the, the long struggle that I mentioned earlier. And that this signifies the struggle of frontline and fence line communities over a very long period of time and their fight for the transition to climate justice. And they discussed how uh, navigating those previously described toxic and abusive legacies can be arduous work, it's isolating work, where people are feeling like these really tiny forces that must dismantle these really enormous structures. And they shared that their struggle is it's hard, it's often messy on this journey, on this journey towards climate justice. So now I'll talk about climate justice. This overarching theme of spiritual relationships within nature uh, refers to the participant experiences of finding spiritual meanings and healing relationships within nature. These experiences were either uh, retained throughout the long struggle, they were regained as a part of that transition, or they were remembered throughout that long struggle towards climate justice. Healing relationships with more than human relatives was a common sub-theme for, again, indigenous participants, um, as depicted in uh, this photo and the narrative. Um, and interestingly, the uh, United States EPA's EJ screen tool did not have indicators for this theme or for any of the remaining themes in the climate justice category. The theme of belonging refers to the sense of belonging in communities where people live, learn, work, uh, play, or, or pray, or feel, again, that spiritual interconnection within nature. And places within nature, like uh, community gardens, as, as you see in this photo and the narrative, were identified as actual common sites for uh, to gather residents who might not normally meet or interact like children and elders. And uh, people shared that fostering a sense of belonging for community members was essential for climate justice movement building. The theme of abundance refers to frontline and fence line communities having local and regenerative economies. So as an example, study participants viewed this challenge of climate mitigation. So again, um, I know you probably all know what that means, but reducing um, the human impacts on climate change, like, re like reducing greenhouse gases, for example. Um, also, they viewed the challenge, again, of climate mitigation and resilience as opportunities to build and support their local economy. So in doing so, implementing rain and community gardens, farms, uh, solar cooperatives, retrofitting housing, as you see here, uh, provided actual regenerative, meaning not extractive, but um, healthy employment opportunities. And it promoted public health in frontline and fence line communities that were impacted by climate change, especially uh, those that were impacted by extreme heat and flooding. And so public health was protected and it was assured in protected communities. And people shared that in, in protected communities, they felt that public health information was really easily accessed by community members. This theme of communities of care uh, describes how frontline and fence line community members and their allies care for each other and for nature. Some of the additional sub-themes included the ways that this care is multicultural, uh, was multi-generational, and again, it was multi-species. And then finally, planetary health and well-being was described as this understanding that public health was inseparable from the health of the planet or planetary health. And aspects for this theme um, from the participant stories included this interconnection of body, mind, and spirit within nature, it's all one. The sense of climate resilience, uh, a, a sense of healing from historical traumas that were mentioned earlier, and this real hope for future generations. So also interestingly, this theme of planetary health, planetary health and well-being was described by 
participants as being both an outcome um, of climate justice, as well as the driving force behind the climate justice movement, movement itself. So meaning it was the driving force, the vision for it. Excuse me. <clears throat> okay, so just to wrap up, and then I really wanna discuss this. So as a reminder, the aim of this was to describe how, I'm sorry, describe how um, nurses and their community partners, <clears throat> oh my goodness, we're envisioning, um, we're perceiving, and we're experiencing climate justice in frontline and fence line communities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Hmm. Oh my gosh. Okay. I mean, <laughs> I think my voice is coming back. So again, to summary, um, climate injustice was perceived as resulting from this colonial severance from nature, mm -hmm. from the supremacy of some people over others, from, <clears throat> I hope I'm not losing my voice. No, you're doing fine. From corporate capitalism and this ongoing climate pollution that was perpetuated um, by corporations and governments. Mm. Then they described how these phenomena were causing increases of death, disease, and despair in their communities. Mm -hmm. They described this transition from climate injustice to climate justice <clears throat> as a long, hard struggle. Did they, um, while you're getting your voice, yeah. was there any indication of how long the struggle? Because like, you know, from the civil rights movement, people have said it takes 40 years to make real change happen, <laughs> 80 years to really see. It, was there a sense of how long, how many generations? Depends on who you, um, I was speaking with. Mm. So when I was talking with indigenous people, the, the struggle has been since colonization. <laughs> okay, hundreds of years. Hundreds of years, but also specifically, there has been, you know, an incident or something where a specific corporation polluted the land. Mm. And that was sort of compounding the struggle, if you will. Again, many of these communities are already marginalized through being either racialized. Um, black, I also um, met with black, a black community as well. I had similar experiences of being racialized and marginalized. Also the, the low-income community in Appalachia, you know, um, it's the extraction economy there. So, you know, as you mentioned earlier too, the, the mining industry and so on has been there a very long time. So, you know, it's perpetuated from these worldviews of the severance from nature that is justifying this ability to dominate other beings because of the belief of separation. So. Why don't we, um, seems like I'm getting my voice back a little bit. I'm not going to go through all of the limitations of the study, but just to be responsible, um, I just want to remind folks that, you know, this was a small group of people I spoke with. They were in um, just a few regions across the United States. So different geographic re regions might have different themes or experiences. I spoke with people that were working through either um, the nurses, the nurse side of it was working through either academic or nonprofit settings. So again, people working in, in like government settings or school settings might have different experiences, right? And I didn't collect demographic information. So people shared their positionalities and their social identities with me, but that wasn't like, I didn't directly ask everyone to self-disclose all of their social identities. So that could have um, affected the, the analysis as well. And because this was my dissertation, I was the researcher, but moving forward, I'm collaborating with community and with people that are working with or in frontline or fence line communities and specifically community-based um, organizations and nonprofits. And so I wanted to um, open it up for discussion. And I think we, we have, do we go until 830? Oh, no, keep going. You're fine. Okay. Okay. So this study holds many implications. And for the sake of time, I wanted to highlight this one for discussion so, you know, again, if there's nurses and that are listening to this, they might know that, yeah, the, the concept of spirituality is not new to nursing, it's not new to those in the healing profession. Again, many of us are familiar with this interconnection of body, mind, spirit. But could further research explore, and this is the question, you know, what incorporating this worldview that promotes spiritual relationships within nature means for non-Indigenous 
nurses or healers or people that invoke a spirit of nursing um, and their community partners also who might not identify as indigenous. And this um, has this question has come about through other uh, conversations I've had about the findings with people. Um, again, for myself, identifying as like a white cis hetero woman of settler colonial ancestry, my ancestry goes back hundreds of years. You know, what does it mean to have spiritual relationships within nature, with this land, with a critical lens on that history? And I, I would like to, I think I'll stop sharing my screen in just a minute so we can open that up for discussion. I want to, of course, acknowledge the public health nurses and the community-based organization representatives for taking their time to share their knowledge and their insights with me. Um, I'm always humbled by the trust that people share with sharing their stories. And then I just recognizing my <laughs> advisor and my dissertation committee because this was my dissertation and it was a lot of work on all of their parts to carry me through all of this. So um, I have my references. I'm happy to share you know, a PDF of my slides with anyone that wants to see them. And we started off today with some check-ins around, um, you know, before we started recording. And I shared that um, the lakes that you see behind me in this screen, this is actually a picture from yesterday of our lake that is normally uh, fully frozen at this time has been having fewer and fewer days of ice. And um, it looks like it's gonna be fully thawed in February, which is very abnormal. So um, with that, I will stop sharing my screen and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Thanks. Well, first of all, that is a, that's a whirlwind tour of your dissertation work. Um, and I hope if we have members of Circle Sanctuary who are involved in healthcare, involved with research, um, who are just interested in climate justice uh, and, and a breakdown of that or in nursing in any way, this is great. And I also want to point out Jess LeClaire is part of our community to be a contact person for further discussion. Yay. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I'd love to hear some initial thoughts or reactions or, um, and again, I'm sorry, I lost my voice in the middle of that <laughs> presentation, but it happens. Oh, I think all of us here know what it's like to lose our voice, don't we? Yeah. Um, any, any thoughts from folks, uh, any takeaways that stuck out or things that stood out? I really appreciate the research and for you sharing this. One of the things I was really happy about is in addition to having the context of what are the problems, that there is also what are possibilities and solutions. And I do think those of us who do healthcare, um, I'm in the mental health care realm. Yes, we need to help those we're serving deal with the problems they have, but part of that is helping to tap into the resources, the ideas, the connections that can really make healing and wellness possible. And to do research where it isn't just problem-centric um, is so refreshing. And I'm I'm wondering what um, feedback you've been getting since you took that more holistic approach. Yeah, thanks, thanks for that. Um, well, initially, I'll sh I'll share feed feedback from the participants was really powerful. The people that shared their stories, they they were very grateful for the opportunity to share their full story. As you mentioned, not only the problems and the issues, but what they were doing about it, how they were partnering, the, the power of the partnership itself as being sustaining. So one thing I didn't really talk through here is the strategies and what they did and all, all the all the ways they, they took action together. But one thing that was really, really powerful that was universal across the participants was this notion of self and collective care that they took for themselves and for each other to persevere in this work throughout that long struggle. Long, you know, again, long is defined by, by the partnership, by the community, by the perspective that they're looking through. Um, but it's really, really hard work. And there is, there can be a sense of despair if you feel alone doing this work. 
And I think that was a huge takeaway. And when I share this out, um, I'm actually going to be sharing it with our research audience in a couple of weeks. I haven't taken this on the road per se. This is, you know, you're, I'm really excited for your feedback here, but, mm -hmm. um, but, but when I, I presented a lot um, on planetary health and climate justice, um, just as concepts to bring into the nursing profession, into the classroom with my students. And the, the, the question that I get just about every time is, is how do you maintain hope? How do you stay in the work, right? And it was really powerful to get some very clear strategies for doing that. Number one is, is do it in partnership. Don't do it alone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have, I have some responses to that, but before I speak, Dennis, did you want to offer some initial? Yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah. Again, fascinating study I, uh, some real interesting implications there regarding um nature experiences and what we're all about i guess my big questions that i was thinking about were probably the aims two and three where i'm automatically starting to think about uh, so how did you get how did people get from the unhealthy side and those particular characteristics over to the positive side and those kind of characteristics so i, I know that's probably a, a, a fair amount beyond um tonight's scope but maybe a couple of examples and the final thing i'll say is that um i don't know to what it, in my research on on these kind of areas the the psychological construct that keeps coming up for which there's a whole lot of research organized around that I think might be relevant to what you're getting at is the concept of nature connectedness. And that is the term nature connectedness and how, how do you help develop it that in people? Um, what positive impacts does that have on people's lives when they experience uh, nature connectedness and inherent in that experience of nature connected is are all those spirit nature spirituality themes that that you are alluding to in your diagram and also typify a lot of the experiences that nature folks like us and uh uh have in natural kinds of environments so those are my comments for now mm. cool well yeah. i'm sorry Oh, I could just respond if if that's helpful to some, I think you had a couple of questions in there. Um, and I'm taking notes too, because this is really helpful for me to, to hear your initial thoughts and reactions. Um, so thank you for that. Um, so yeah, so the second aim was looking specifically at the strategies that they're utilizing. And, um, and one of my guiding tools was something that we use in public health nursing called the public health intervention wheel, if you will. This is um, I can provide a resource to it if, the, if there's of interest, but to give some, some examples, um, one was something called, um, like a health event investigation, which is just the category in the, in the nurse intervention wheel. But for example, when, um, the nurse and her community partner in Appalachia were concerned about worker health with the fracking, so the frack socks I had on that one slide, right? In the fracking industry. And they were basically just like moving these things around with no protective gear or equipment. They were concerned about radium exposure. And, um, and so they, they actually were able to measure the amount of radium on the workers' boots, which were really, really high. And the workers weren't wanting to really speak out against not having protective equipment. And But then they started noticing that they were having a lot of health symptoms, um, a lot of cancers were starting to show up in the community. A lot of the, the, the children were getting a lot of dental um, caries because it, it gets into your bones actually and can affect your bone health. Yeah. Yeah. So right. they they were doing things like that. Many communities were using some something called air monitors to really measure the amount of pollution exposure in the community to use as a type of like advocacy tool. Some were also testing the water. In their areas, they're really kind of data collecting on their own. Then they were using this, this information to provide health teaching to other community members. So sometimes they would 
like um, hold, like organize events or hold panel sessions like, like this today on Zoom with, with their community partners and other members in their community. Sometimes they would go into the schools and educate the children about, you know, um, climate change, for example, and, and, and the effects of that um, and all the things that can be done and that are being done. Um, there was a lot of community organizing that was happening too. Um, on the ground, which is um, a big tool that public health nurses use to, again, you know, kind of follow the, the community's lead on what needs to happen and how that needs to happen. Sometimes they would form that, sometimes they would form the, the community-based organization. So actually one nurse formed the CBO with the community and, and organized around it in that way. Um, sometimes they they be they grouped with networks of of other coalition, they formed a coalition of, of community-based organiz organizations that had a network. And that all led into things like advocacy. So whether you're advocating for policy enforcement or policy development um, and doing some marketing around that too. So, you know, so I guess just like a broad brush overview, those are some examples of some of the, the things that they were doing together. And um, right now I'm, I'm um, analyzing a little bit more deeply into the partnership processes because I, I heard there were a lot of steps that came before the partnership formed itself. And so I'm really interested in learning more about like how this nurse and community partner kind of came together in these different scenarios. And so we're looking at that right now. Um, and then just to quickly touch on your other um, comment, thank you about nature connectedness. Yeah, interconnection within nature is, is really central to the planetary health movement. And that's something I'm not really presenting on today, but my, first study was looking primarily at climate justice. Um, but what I heard again was that there was this intersection of pollution, exposures, climate change, and then this impacts on nature. And we're, we know that the United Nations has identified this triple planetary crisis called climate change, biodiversity loss, and pollution, right? This triple planetary crisis. And this is what the United Nations Environment Program is focusing on. And this is sort of the languaging that um, many people are starting to use around promoting planetary health, which is identifying and, and addressing the way that human disruptions on all of Earth's natural systems, not just the climate, but air, water, soil, other living organisms are impacting not just human health, but also all life. And so there's this framework that was developed called the Planetary Health Education Framework, so that all people that are working on these, on these issues across all disciplines can use a shared language around how we're talking about it. And at the center of that framework is the interconnection within nature domain as, as central to how we're building this planetary health movement. And I was actually on the writing team for that domain. And we looked at all of the research on nature connectedness and, and everything that's being done. And our indigenous scholars that were a part of the team said, nature connectedness still feels like it implies the separateness that people have to connect with nature and right. they're not already one, that we're not already yeah. nature. And so we were moved lovingly into this um, interconnection within nature conversation. And that's also what I heard people talking about in the study too. And again, every person that identified as indigenous talked about this as essential to climate justice was either remembering or regaining or retaining the sense of interconnection within nature because some of them had felt severed from their land because of how polluted their land was. So they were doing things like creating a farm for food sovereignty and so on. So people could then you know, offsite at a different place, try to have this reconnection or inter remember their, their inherent interconnection within nature. That's I really, I long. really appreciate that last point because I have been, I have been um, catching myself, and and I know Dennis, you love talking about nature connection. And I've used that forever, but I asked myself recently, I was like, wait a minute, exactly that. It's like, am I connecting to nature? Am I being with nature? Am I? And I came up with the phrase, and I'm actually getting ready to do a podcast on it next month called the the. Um, restorative power of nature belonging 
And so for me, it's exactly what you're talking about. This this need, and this comes a lot out of my palliative care work as a as an advanced practice board certified chaplain, working with people with serious illnesses who don't have medical cures, but who are looking for healing. And and central to that in so many ways is I'm not going to say nature connection. They may or may not have eco spirituality as a form of practice. They may or may not embrace an eco centric worldview, but they have a sense of belonging when they are within their spiritual bioregion or within um, certain landscapes or ecosystems. They just feel just like people taking psilocybin which now is becoming a medical event has forever, you know, been a spiritual event with people coming to a greater sense of consciousness with the belonging of, of all life. Right. So that that's a concept I'm working on here. And um, I wonder if, I don't know if there's time here, but maybe a future discussion about how the nursing profession even views that. I wanted to cycle back to, to um, as part of my feedback about what stood out is coming from a community organizing perspective. I had the opportunity when I was pastoring as a community organizing pastor to become a partner with um, uh, some public health nurses advocating for nursing policy within the San Jose Bay Area community. Um, and it was, it was a fascinating process. And and so I think community organizing, it's amazing use of story all the time, you know, to impress upon people with asks. But what stood out about the research and the presentation was that on the climate and justice side, something that really was like wang to me was who is setting the moral compass? I mean, this is a spiritual and moral issue, what we're talking about. These things are existential issues. They're profoundly moral and spiritual. Morality meaning how we how we assess right and wrong. And I guess when I say moral compass, it's like, who gets to set the directions? Who gets to set what is our true north? You know, who gets to say how we navigate what is right and wrong? And right now, I thought the conversation that really matters is around public risk. I don't know that if that's a public health term, I'm trying to think in that space, like public risk, public health and safety risk. And it's like corporate capitalism has set the moral compass so clearly that profits always are justified over people, public good, and things like the planet and other forms of life aren't even on the radar. They're just commodities. They're not even considered. And 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 they are saying corporate, corporate climate, corporate, capitalism has basically ingrained the moral compass that says it is acceptable to sacrifice life, so much life, diversity, biodiversity. It's acceptable to accept war and territorial war and ravage as long as profits continue to be made, that that is acceptable. And the drive always is for greater profits at everyone else's risk. That, to me, that is the degeneration of this civilization right now. When I hear indigenous peoples talking about the end of corporate capitalism, how it has to be Avatar, James Cameron, it's like, it's because of this. And then on the positive side, like Selena said, I just thought how wonderful it is, how important it is to have a positive vision of you know what you want your world to be and what you want your world to look like for your children and your grandchildren whose responsibility it is our responsibility to protect that too and i can't help but notice that the vision for everything you outlined with climate justice is always dismissed by the politicians paid for by corporate capitalism by the judges and everyone else who's bought and paid for by them. It's always dismissed this positive vision as being um, too unrealistic, too expensive, too naive, too woo woo, too woke. So those things really stood out to me. And I thought that was a very strong presentation, but you didn't say it, but they popped up to me loud and clear from a community organizing perspective. <laughs> So are you getting helpful feedback? It's so fun that this has uh, turned into a preview I mean, of another thing you're going to do. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, the, the other thing is I won't have as much time 
<laughs> but um, you know, this is this is really helpful. And I'm, you know, again, when I learned, oh wow, you know, spiritual, like the severance that this worldview that people are separate from nature. There's a severance that's ha that's happened. This in you know, it's colonial, right? And I mean, we can talk about the roots of that and, you know, what was happening, you know, during witches were being burning during the time of colonization. Like this is, you know, you don't talk about your connection with the nature. It's not safe. Right. So there's a severance that's, that's happened. That's allowed for this domination, this domination worldview mindset and of supremacy, male, like patriarchy, white supremacy, human supremacy over all other beings. Right. That's just is this dominating worldview. And it seems to me that if this, if we can regain or retain the sense of interconnection and spiritual relationships within nature throughout this struggle for justice, that's that was described as really key. And that again, fosters a sense of belonging like you were talking about within nature, within community. It fosters a, a community that cares for each other and for the planet and for nature. It fosters the sense of abundance, right? Communities caring for themselves and, the, and each other. And then, and then health for the planet and health and human health too. So the spirituality is so critical. It's so important. And, you know, how do we shift the worldview that people have? It seems to me that people that are doing that kind of work, all of you <laughs> and us, like this is central, this is key, right? Especially... I think for people maybe that have like these colonial backgrounds, you know, how can we heal that? I don't know. These are some questions I'm bringing into the group, but this is just what I've been thinking about. You know, for people that don't identify as indigenous and maybe do have a long history of colonial settlers in the area that have, have, you know. We need to be talking about it. Right. <laughs> I, I think another thing that comes to my mind right away from a public uh, health and public policy perspective is in these frontline areas to one thrust would be to make sure that there are, are natural places that are safe to go to, to be in nature, to begin to feel this sense of belonging with nature. And secondly, it would be building in programming to help people get them out there in nature and, and quote, quote, connecting or re-interconnecting with nature, however we want to frame it. Um, that kind of flows from this whole kind of thinking, I would think. So many, so many therapies today. It's so funny. I, I always laugh because I, again, I, I cited psilocybin and, you know, I was one of those people who <laughs> was raising my hand saying, ah, I know we're talking about the need now to have like LLPs and nurse practitioners sitting in a sterilized lab with people who are taking capsules with like eye things over a tube and we've clinicized this experience, but rem let's remember yeah. That the origins of this have ancient, ancient roots with indigenous uh, communities that revered plant spirit medicine and that knew the plants, took care of the plants, foraged the plants carefully, revere that relationship, that kinship they have with the plants, develop these ceremonies as spiritual ceremonies, often gritty, muddy you know, with dirt and feathers and all kinds of stuff around that, you know, not sanitized, not clinicized, shepherding and guiding these experiences, which further reinforce this deep sense of belonging with the planet. So what's being done to respect even the anthropology of this? Or do we have like indigenous spiritual leaders, shamans, you know, medicine people involved? Or is it just another extractive industry now? And that's so much of what happens when we do these nature connect forest bathing has now become this over clinicized. Like, come on, get out there and be with the natural elements and feel it. It's just, I, I see Selena smiling. <laughs> we could go on. Well, I think it's really important to have these conversations, to take a look at the research 
that's being done. And Jessica, you are doing cutting edge research. I also think on a global scale, public health is increasingly being identified as something that needs to be part of global conversations regarding um, environmental work and preservation mm. and well-being. And at the most recent COP, yes, there's always stuff around the conference and parties, the UN environmental conferences. But I was really encouraged that there was actually people in public health that had programming at the most recent COP. And as we look at our planet as a whole, we need to hear the stories from around the planet we need to be aware of the problems and also be aware of what solutions are working and actually have as part of our ongoing identity as humans, seeing ourselves as not only belonging to the area and the support groups we have most immediate with us, but to develop that global consciousness of us being part of this living biosphere. So I see lots of amazing things that can spin off of your work so far, Jessica. And I'm truly hoping as um, this goes out in cyberspace, those of you who are watching and getting inspired and reflecting on some of this conversation will be part of the solution in terms of sharing this and liking it and letting others um, also consider these things. So I'm very appreciative of this video podcast, our Green Faith Circle conversation about your work, Jessica. Um, thank you. And Jessica, I want to allow you to say one last thing, and then I'll go ahead and wrap up on the heels of what Selena just said. Is there one final thing you want to say? Uh, yeah, just that I'm so grateful for the opportunity to have this conversation with all of you. And um, I welcome anyone that wants to like watches this or wants to reach out or share some additional thoughts with me. This is, um, you know, an evolving program of research. And uh, I would love to hear other people's experiences and ideas. So um, I'll say my my email, but maybe that can also yes. Or if you if you don't want to say that publicly, folks, if you go to the Circle Sanctuary website, you click on Circle Green, click on that address for the opt-in to Green Circle. You can send a message there. It'll come to me saying, I want to reach out to Jess LeClaire. We're just protecting your privacy that with good. that. But that way, shoot it out because my hope and that that segues to my wrap up is that's what these meetings are like, folks. These are conversations and they're different every time. We've got different members, we've got different expertise, but protecting the planet is an intersectional movement. And so it's a delight to be able to highlight different aspects of that with our conversations. And in Circle, we've got some of these fabulous members like Jess who are doing really cutting edge, really great things. So if you're involved in public health or if you are interested in a career in public health, if you have an interest in community organizing or if you care about the health and safety of your community, please reach out, get in touch with us through Circle Green, opt in, get in touch with her and share this YouTube with other people. Thank you for tuning in, everybody. Thank you, Jess, Selena, Dennis, as always. Thank you for your time. And um, everybody stay true and blue. We'll see you in the green space.